We got Vice Kamala, Vice President Kamala Harris giving remarks on economic policy. Okay, there's a lot of good stuff in there. We're going to be talking about that a lot. And we're also obviously going to be reacting to the Republicans. We're also going to be reacting to the uh, Republicans reacting to Kamala Harris's policies. And that's it. Sydney Sweeney via Instagram. What is the What the fuck? Yo, hey, what? Dude, what? Bro, that's, that's not, I don't, dude, what the fuck? Yo, what the fuck? What the fuck? fuck dude 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 when i see when i see stuff like that it's just like when i see the type of shit that is like it's like the lebron james uh dunking on serbians meme you know what i mean it's just there's just some stuff this is what jesus died for it's just it's it's unacceptable it's fucked up it's let's just move on i need to i need to lock in i need to lock in it's fucked up i need to log in okay she is the lebron james of white women it's true your stream is on bro what are you doing yo it's not my fault somebody fucking sent it to me like what do you mean you're right i shouldn't be clicking on links like that he gone white woman bro come on bro come on bro that's like lebron vibing to adele on the train meanwhile lebron in the rain dude he's so he's awesome am i glazing is that too much like I, I don't know why like seeing him like this it just makes me feel happy like seeing him happy makes me feel happy am i parasocial with lebron like a little bit like a little bit is that what it is but like watching him just enjoy life you know what i mean having his his best white girl summer like it's just you don't even watch basketball yeah because what lebron does is cannot be called basketball like not only not only did he invent the sport but he also improved it you know what i mean so it's like for me i i don't even know what we should be calling what he does anyway i think he needs a restraining order against you that's crazy he would never do that to me because we're best friends in my mind anyway take vid plus response what do you mean um, Colin Patriot is weird yet. The ones doing woke indoctrination is you anyways. Here's a beautiful video of normal evangelicals. Yeah, what is this? A dad proposes his 20 year old daughter with a purity ring. Another emergency landing. Can you cover the Republicans being piss babies over Wallace's taco comments? Oh yeah. Don't forget. We're going to be talking about that too. It's my favorite fucking genre of weirdos when they get like, when they become like SJWs, but for like white people is one of the silliest, lamest, dumbest fucking things you should you can do is straight up is straight up embarrassing i don't know why people like whole ass adults do this kind of thing because i think it's like annoying to normal white people in general as well apparently after the catch a pig predator video that style of video started pop popping off even more in the platform um yeah it's the where is it where the fuck is it i tweeted a lot this morning didn't I tweet about this? Yeah, conservatives get so lame when they won't let the whitest people make white people jokes. Like, it's just, it's just so silly. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, they're so mad. They're so mad that Tim Walls, like, made a joke. Guy talk. Listen, I'm not much of a spice guy. And they're like, they're so, why did you reinstall Twitter? I didn't. Um, I just do it on my desktop. I go on my desktop. Um, these motherfuckers be like, comedy is now illegal because I can't say the N word. And then they like, in the same breath will be like how dare you disrespect white people it's like bro choose a lane like what are you doing like if you're gonna be if you're gonna be a social justice warrior i think being a social justice warrior over like white people jokes is the lamest way that you could be a social justice warrior in general like it literally is so insane to me it's like you are unironically doing this thing you are unironically doing this thing where you're like no jokes no jokes allowed not even like you know permissible jokes you just can't do it it's like it's akin to fucking woke scolding black people for making jokes about black people like who the fuck was stay in your lane dude like what are you doing
It just, oh my god, oh my fucking god, dude. They're so goddamn lame. They're so unimaginably fucking lame. Dan Bilzerian is based. What the fuck? Yeah, he got PBD to admit that there's a genocide going on apparently, and then schooled him. I don't know what the fuck's happening there, but anyway, let's continue. Yeah, it's just they need to stop. They need to. Republicans need to stop. They actually, you know what? Fuck it. Keep going, Republicans. You're doing a great job, actually. Yeah. Um, we'll do the taco drama in a second. Let's get started. We turn. Harris and Biden are reuniting on the campaign trail. They shouldn't, in my opinion, but whatever, you know. We're now to the race for the White House. Vice President Harris is set to lay out her economic plan today after making her first appearance with President Biden since he dropped out of the race. Former President Trump held another press conference, and Rachel Scott is here with more. Good morning, Rachel. Hey, Rebecca, good morning to you. Well, Vice President Kamala Harris has only been in the race now for a few weeks. She has not outlined any policy plans yet, but all of that will change today. She is set to unveil her economic agenda as she really tries to thread this needle between touting the Biden-Harris record and laying out her own vision for the country. This morning, Vice President Kamala Harris set to unveil her economic agenda in North Carolina today after appearing with President Biden for the first time since he dropped out of the race. Few leaders in our... It, the craziest part of the economic agenda so far is that, like, it's obviously populist. It's obviously good. I'm actually shocked that they're defending it. And um, I think that the media might actually start swiping at them. Uh, the media might actually start swiping at them a little bit because uh, the New York Times already started. The New York Times already started. Like, they, they, br they brought together some of the most annoying fucking economists to be like, yeah, at the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break and Kamala Harris has no answer for it. They don't realize that she does. It's still the same principle, $6 a, $6 a month in, a, in the form of a subscription or a free one in the form of a Twitch Prime will allow you to avoid the top of the hour ad break under the Kamala regime, under the Biden regime, under the Trump regime. It's always the same, right? Um, so like the New York Times is lying about the agenda a little bit, okay? But I think that the Democrats should probably keep pushing that, uh, that there's also an alternative method. Like you can get a gifted sub if you're lucky. Like, you can get uh, a gifted sub if you're lucky to avoid the uh, top of the hour ad break as well. And I think that's also important to acknowledge, I think. Also important to acknowledge, also important to recognize. Here's the three-minute ad break now. Okay, it's $1 in Egypt, not 6 Nice. But, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about the fact that Kamala Harris unveiled the, uh, the agenda for uh, one of the most like one of the most pressing issues that that I think is is a top of mind, right? For a lot of Americans, young, old, everyone, it is the affordability crisis that everyone is experiencing, both in housing and in just all consumer goods across the board. And I find it I mean, I don't find it odd that the media immediately started launching PAC because that's what they do. They're in the pocket of big corporations at the end of the day. Um, they're in a bind because they hate Donald Trump for volatility. And also Donald Trump has a lot of economic policy points that will harm uh, big corporate donors as well, like instituting major tariffs and stuff, um, specifically on Chinese goods. So that's already like uh, that's already something that a lot of people are worried about. But on the other hand, I think the Kamala team is also using this advantage to be like, no, this is the real way that we're going to solve the affordability crisis. We're going to go after price gougers, right? And, uh, and of course, the media immediately, as soon as they show like a level of sanity in their policy making in their agenda, the media has to be like, whoa, 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 you can't do that. That's communism. Um, but yeah, let's see. Our nation have done more. Was the reason she can't do things with Biden right now? Great question. Um, I don't know if you know this, but she's running for president currently. Um, there are certain things that she could do. I think foreign policy wise, there's definitely certain aspects of her agenda that she could communicate across the Biden's team and Biden's camp on foreign policy. But as far as like, as far as uh, uh, like instituting more power, instituting more power to uh, the FTC under the Biden regime is probably going to be too difficult to pull off while also simultaneously running for president. Now, before people say, oh, she doesn't have Congress, she doesn't have Congress, a lot of the stuff that they're talking about is not actually, is, is not limited by congressional approval. So just so you understand, so she could technically do it if Biden wanted to do it. But I don't think that there is like, I don't think that there is any enough momentum at this moment. Um, 
didn't the court say they won't let that stuff happen yeah okay well you know you know i have an answer for that it's called who gives a fuck okay let's continue on so many issues including to expand access to affordable health care like then joe biden the president touting the first ever negotiations with pharmaceutical companies to lower the cost of 10 drugs. Come on, all of us in this room, we're going to keep standing up for Big Pharma. I fought too damn hard to yield now. The VP does not have unilateral decision-making power. They have influencing power. Exactly. Uh, 100%. And like, she is already currently with this agenda, with this economic agenda. She's already personally saying that they're going to continue what they've done so far in the Brandon regime uh, with respect to the FTC, with respect to Lena Khan. Um, that's actually a really solid thing for the record. I, I do think this is good. I will, I will always be honest with you. When I see the Democrats doing something good, I will tell you, okay? I will tell you. I think that, uh, you know, I think that personally running alongside Brandon like this, not the greatest thing, okay? But that's fine. It's okay. Biden has also made um, made bold proclamations, even when he was running as well. He's made bold proclamations about what he wants to do with the economy. So I think the Kamala campaign is basically continuing that agenda, and um, it's not it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a very good thing. Okay. We're not backing down. But with polls showing most Americans are still dissatisfied with the economy, the vice president will offer her own proposals later today. Her campaign says Harris will propose up to $25,000 in down payment support for first time. Remember this decrepit skeleton that everyone decided is on fit for office? Want to hear from him again? Yeah, I mean, look, they're going to they're going to give him his flowers. Um, I think that I think that personally they're giving they're giving him his flowers because like that's the only way you can get motion with them. Um, that's it. There's like I can't see any other genuine reason as to why you would just like plaster Biden anywhere else. Like they're they're literally being like, hey, you're the goat. Thank you for dropping out and doing the right thing and not being an old curmudgeon that refused to like listen the fucking reason. I think that's basically what this is. Okay. That's that's what I suspect is going on here. And it might it might be so that they can maybe get Biden to be more reasonable about some of the things that have to some of the things that have to change right now when he is the president. When he has the power to to set the stage, you know, in some ways it feels like maybe they're doing the bear hug strategy. Um, it also hurts the coup narrative. Exactly. When Biden comes out and campaigns, when Biden comes out and campaigns alongside Kamala Harris, that completely deflates the idea that Republicans have tried to present, which is like the Democrats did a coup. The Democrats did a coup like it just destroys that narrative. You know what I mean? So that's probably another reason why they're doing that as well. But I think most importantly, they're keeping him around because like ultimately, ultimately they, they want to keep him happy because, uh, you know, he, he still is the president and he still has the capacity to completely fuck this up. All right, let's continue. Home buyers who have paid their rent on time for two years, expand the child tax credit, providing up to $6,000 per child and implement a first ever federal ban on price gouging on food. I and can grocery. only get so hard. I'm going to be honest with you. I like there is, this is, this is, <laughs> this is great stuff, Chad. I'm not joking. When I say this, like I was actually shocked when Biden was talking about a federal cap, like federal rent control. That's an insane policy. Like that's not something that you hear from the, from the Democrats a lot. Uh, a lot of times, like, Biden originally instituted some kind of rent control um, that was like super, super limited, okay? Super, super limited. Then he turned around and said, we're going to try to push for a federal rent control uh, across the board at, and, and we're going to limit it at 5%. And that, that, is all, that was also pretty fire. Every time they were like, bro, you're old, he would just come out and be like, I'm going to do another fucking progressive populist policy, Okay. Every time they'd be like, you're old, please leave. He'd be like, I'm doing socialism, Jack. <laughs> Nominal message, worst messenger. I kept saying that back then, and I will repeat that. Now, not the worst messenger, and the message is fucking great. So, you know, I will give credit where credit is due, okay? These are things that are, these are things that are genuinely good. It's one of the first times where I've ever seen the Democratic Party actually fight, okay? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, can you can you actually set the bag up real quick? Uh, wait, hold on. Let me. An idea already drawing criticism from Donald Trump. She wants price controls 
And if they worked, I'd go along with it too, but they don't work. The former president speaking at his golf club in New Jersey, surrounded by groceries for a press conference his advisor said would focus on the economy. We're going to have a crash like a 1929 crash if she gets in. Harris's running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, accusing Trump of rooting for economic catastrophe. There is nothing funnier. There is nothing funnier. Democrats literally lie every four years about what they will say will happen. What makes you think she isn't lying about literally everything she's saying? You're not wrong about this. Democrats have consistently lied about what they're going to end up doing. The difference in this circumstance, okay, the difference in this circumstance is that you have to pay attention to what they're lying about and what they've done so far. On the issue of the economy, the Biden administration has actually pursued through the federal regulatory bodies a pretty radical agenda. That's not a joke. That's not a lie. That is real. That is something that they did. But more importantly than that, Democrats ultimately never make proclamations of this sort. This is new. They do radical proclamations when it comes to like, oh, we're going to do amnesty, which is weirdly enough, an area where they're actually retriangulating to the right. And I don't like that. So in a, in a weird way, it's been a complete swap. On the one hand, on the one hand, they literally are pushing for economic policies that they don't openly fucking state ever okay things that are like um things that are that will immediately be considered like communist socialist radical crazy by the republicans that they shy away from usually okay but on the other hand they've completely swapped the ticket on stuff like uh you know protections for immigrants protections for migrants and things of that nature they've actually shifted on that entirely you say that this is the first time you remember Dems fighting, right? Well, Kamala is the first admin since 1992 that doesn't have Clinton advisors for economic and foreign policy. She'll turn them down, they asked. This is the shift, in my opinion. Yeah, like, this is, for the Democratic Party, if, you were, if we are looking at this with, uh, with respect to, like, what the Democrats have, have put forward usually, this is one of the boldest agendas that I've ever seen. And something that's really interesting about the way that they're communicating this agenda is that they're not... Like, one thing that Kamala Harris said that I found very interesting was, if I win the Senate, we'll do this, right? She didn't just say, oh, we're going to do this when you elect me. She literally has said, once I win the Senate, like, once we win Congress and the White House, we will pass this. That's a really interesting way to message, okay? That's number one. Number two, a lot of the policies that she's talking about, some of the policies that she's talking about does not require congressional uh, power. Some of the things that she's talking about are directly done through the federal regulatory agencies, which she would have control over. So that is actually really fucking solid. Okay. I put that to the former president. He's been saying that he believes that you want things to get worse so that you can campaign on it, that you're rooting for well, failure. What's your response to that? I wish I didn't have to do this. If our country were run by Democrats and it was run beautifully, where we were really being productive and everything else, I would have never done this. Trump went from discussing inflation to weighing in on the weight of electric trucks to calling Harris a communist. Some of his own Republican supporters have begged him to focus on policy, but Trump making it clear he's not going to change. I think I'm entitled to personal attacks. I don't have a lot of respect for her. I don't have a lot of respect for her intelligence, and I think she'll be a terrible president. And I think it's very important that we win and whether the personal attacks are good, bad, I mean, she certainly attacks me personally. She actually called me weird. He's weird. Yeah, so don't expect those personal attacks to change anytime soon. Well, the first vice presidential debate is now set. Governor Tim Walls and Senator J.D. Vance have both agreed to face off on October 1st. And of course, ABC News. Mentioning congressional support also adds a cushion for failure. It's also honest. And I don't know why they don't do that more frequently, because it's good to also mention that you need the con you need congressional approval in this situation and i think it helps the down ballot chances like there are there are obviously senate races on the same ballot there are house races on the same ballot that could tilt in the direction of the democratic party's control over both the house of representatives and the senate and the fucking white house so that's like a good thing that i think you should be communicating overall um it's also great that they're doing the you're weird, we want to help people, you just want to fucking talk shit uh, about things that nobody cares about. 
And you can tell that that's good because Donald Trump is responding to it like a little baby. Okay. We'll have the very first presidential debate between Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris on September 10th, Rebecca. And there will be so much focus on that, Rachel. There's also focus on the vice presidential candidates, and our new poll shows how Americans are viewing them. Yeah, and this race has entirely transformed this summer. A new candidate in the race and both campaigns choosing their running mates. So how are they stacking up? Our new ABC News, Washington Post, and Ipsos poll shows that Governor Tim Walz is getting more of a positive reception at 39% <laughs> compared to his Republican rival, Senator J.D. Vance, who is at 32%, and it's not just the reception. More Americans approve of Walls for the job. Now, both of these candidates are veterans. Walls served in the National Guard. Vance in the Marine Corps. Our poll shows that Vance is polling slightly higher among veterans. This is notable given... That's not surprising. Come on. Come on. We know why. That's that's because he's red. He's a Republican. That's it. Yeah, that that is the least... First of all, there a lot of vets are hogs okay if you're unfamiliar it is you think it's surprising come on dude it's it's because he's a fucking republican vets love vets are hogs this is surprising to me no i think like i was watching a tiktok about a fucking marine dude i mean look you know you know better you're a vet okay but i feel like they just they see they see republican on the ticket and they're like that's my guy It'll be harder once they debated if Tim Walz campaigns with any sharpshooting videos. A lot of vets get a steady dose of Fox News. Yeah, there's a there's a shit ton. There's a shit ton of hogs in, in uh, the field of, of vets in this country. That doesn't mean that there aren't like plenty of fucking, you know, even socialist veterans and whatnot. Obviously, many of them in this chat, but like that's not that's not shocking to me at all. All of the backlash and criticism that Walls has faced for how he has characterized his military career. Lindsay. All right, Rachel, thanks so much. Kamala Harris finally um Kamala Harris to unveil economic policy absolute socialism so we're gonna dive into this stuff okay we're gonna dive into this stuff here here is uh one of them uh here's here's some of the top of the line uh uh you know things that she unveiled six thousand dollar tax uh, child tax credit for newborns in the first year major restore Biden's child tax credit up to three thousand six hundred dollar monthly checks incredible stuff up to 25k in government assistance for first time buyers with i think like perfect renters credit um that's also pretty solid universal 20, uh, 35 dollar insulin cap which was already like a continuation of the former like a lot of this stuff is a continuation of biden's policies right universal 35 dollar cap is an extension like it it builds on the prior momentum on this sort 2000 out of pocket cap for pharmaceutical drugs incredible work other provisions include federal ban on price gouging. This is the one I like a lot, okay? For food and groceries, providing FTC new power to penalize companies. That's major. There was a lot of talk. There was a lot of back and forth among Democratic donors that would go on CNN and say, we want Lena Khan out. Lena Khan it has been doing phenomenal work and trust busting at the FTC. Um, she is a shining star that is only there because of Biden's responsiveness to his left flank. This was part of the reason why Bernie Sanders was so... Did you shut it off? Okay, perfect. Thank you. So all of this, uh, I would say, uh, all of this are, are, are pretty, good, uh, pretty good signs for the future. If Biden has so many good policies, why didn't he use them as talking points during his campaign? Great question. I think the answer is he was so fucking old and so decrepit. That's it. Like, that's, that's literally it. I would cringe sometimes when he would say the good policies because I was like, fuck, he's the worst person. He is the worst messenger for even good economic populist policies. So, like, you know, he just kept going, NATO. That's what he cared about. That's what he remembered over and over again. Do you think Bernie has had an effect on this administration, on the Biden administration? Abs absolutely. Okay. Is price gouging just raising prices? How is it measured? I'm not for this. I just don't understand how you determine if a company has gouged or not. Great question. So price gouging is something that a lot of people understand when it's like times of, of crisis, right? In a natural disaster zone, for example, all of a sudden people that are selling uh, life-saving supplies or, or things that are absolute necessities will hike up the prices because there's obviously additional extra demand and limited supply so they will turn around and just be like oh yeah you want toilet paper it's gonna be 15 bucks right 
This is literally, this is, I believe is technically illegal if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the thing is, the thing is a lot of corporations across the board in the post COVID universe have done that have for uh, consumer goods in general. And you can, you can take a look at it. You can, you can see, um, how much prices have gone up overall uh, and how much other prices have adjusted post COVID, right? Or like post logistical hurdles, post energy crisis. Like there were many different moments where prices have obviously understandably gone up as a consequence of the price of a barrel of uh, gas going up that increases the prices for everything. It is technically still arbitrary. It is technically still arbitrary, but, um, you know, this is one of the greatest examples of it. All right. High egg prices and profits at largest U.S. producer soaring more than 700%. For example, egg prices rose 60% last year. Okay. This was a major issue. March 29th, 2023. Everybody kept saying, oh, it's because of the avian flu. It's because of the avian flu. Except the fucking major producers of eggs actually weren't even hit by the fucking avian flu. They just jacked up the fucking prices because everybody was like, oh, it's the avian flu. They had zero instances of avian flu and they still fucking jacked up the prices. Okay. That is a great example of price gouging in general. Companies taking advantage of the, the, uh, the confusion and the chaos and just hiking up prices in general. Why don't they just target monopoly instead of pri uh, price gouging? What do you think Lena Khan is doing? That's so weird. You just said Lena Khan goat, Lena Khan goat, Lena Khan goat. That's precisely what she's been doing as well. Yeah, landlords raising rent because of market conditions too. That's exactly what it is. Using any and every reason to hike up prices when you don't have any supply issues is precisely what price gouging is. So, bro, you're so wrong. I'm an ornithologist and avian influenza has been wrecking chicken populations. Crow car honk. The crow guy... I will literally never feed crows peanuts or salty snacks if you keep this shit up in the chat. Okay? I'm letting you know right now. I will never give crows salty peanuts if you keep this shit up. You are causing me to never feed crows salty snacks that they actually appreciate a lot. Including salty peanuts. Or sorry, you need to feed them unsalted peanuts. Salted food hurts them. Okay. Unsalted. I will only feed them salty snacks if you keep this shit up. Don't make me. Okay. <sighs> um, anyway, we're going to continue on the price gouging stuff in a second. Um, so there's other, there's other cool shit in there. Obviously, uh, the, e, the EITC expanding that is the earned income tax credit. Uh, working with states to cancel medical debt is a huge one. That's really fucking popular. It's really solid in general. Extending ACA subsidies, um, that's fine. I think that what they should be doing is also expanding uh, Medicare in general. That was a Bernie policy. It's like literally the most popular out of all the policies that Bernie Sanders actually tested uh, in the latest uh, Data for Progress poll, uh, uh, the latest Data for Progress study that came out that showed that that was polling at like an 80% approval rating or something, like putting uh, dental vision care on... Uh, Medicare is like insanely popular with a constituency that actually reliably votes. We're talking about, you know, obviously 65 and over. These are people, these are, these are people that do vote reliably. These are people that love their health care. They love their health insurance. So um, it's a really solid way to sneak in Medicare expansion in general, lower the fucking age of Medicare to 55, maybe, you know, and slowly but surely you arrive at Medicare for all. Who knows? Um, so there's that. Clever way to think about what's happening on CTC, child tax credit. The next question is, how does Harris pay for these initiatives? The temporary Biden CTC alone was $1.4 trillion or so over 10 years. And a blanket extension of ACA subsidies is $270 billion over a decade. Okay. Um, there are also some supply side initiatives for home building. I think expanding on uh, 3 million homes like opening up the way to allow 3 million additional units to be constructed. Um, I don't know the exact details of how that would happen. That could be a scary way in which they do it because the Republicans also have a similar policy on their agenda. 
Um, that could also be a good way to do it. Um, New York Times had a good article on price gouging yesterday. No, they didn't. They had a bad article on price gouging as far as I saw. I saw the top line on that article. It was economists shitting on it. <laughs> so I don't know if I consider it to be good. Um, so, you know, there's also the basic stuff in which, like, the Republicans are being uh, weird about Kamala Harris's name. Here is one example of this. Nancy Mace was on CNN. Kamala's Kamala's uh oh, you right. you say, almost got it. I will say you Kamala's did. name any way that I want to. No, but Kamala's, but you mispronounced her and you did. also misjudged. You're just did and I'll do it mispronouncing again. her name. That's what I'm doing. Explain price gouging, please. Dude, I just got done explaining it. What the fuck? Were you did you just tune in? What's happening? What the fuck? I literally just explained it, dude. That's crazy. Maybe he just got in, though. Maybe he just got in. Or maybe he's a mobile chatter and hasn't gotten to that point of the fucking stream yet. I don't know. This is like a real, oh, they didn't teach us this shit in school moment where it's like maybe you just weren't paying attention. Okay. What? Alan Lichman's son what are your thoughts responded to you. Okay. I, that is the most insane drama. I don't care. Okay, let's continue. Quay slandering mobile chatters. Yeah. Okay. Let's continue. Let's continue. So there was this. Um, I'm a mobile chatter. Please be gentle with us. Anyway, what time are you going to the Beyblade tournament? Okay, guys, stop. Stop memeing. My ADHD is out of control today, and you guys are abusing it. Okay. You're using and abusing my ADHD today. Oh, my God. Okay. Matt Bruning's reaction to Harris's policy. Uh, quick reaction to Harris's policies. Matt Bruning is a good egg, obviously. Love the guy from peoplespolicyproject.org. He is the leftist nerd, the leftist econ nerd that we need. Kamala Harris unveiled many campaign policy proposals today. Jeff Stein and Dan Diamond have covered it at the Washington Post. Below our reactions to some of these proposals. 25K for first time home buyers. This is a bad idea. It is unfair, unfair to people who, even with the subsidy, cannot afford to buy a home or those who prefer to rent because there's a demand subsidy without any corresponding price controls. Some of the money will just get captured as higher home prices, negating the affordability goals of the policy. Okay, not 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 an unfair take. It is not an unfair take at all. I think it's a true take. Okay, that one is, these are not the strongest ones. The ones I care about is this, okay? But he says, it is unclear what this even means. In a New York Times article about it, Jim Tankersley writes, Harris campaign officials did not detail how a price gouging, gouging ban would be enforced or what current corporate behaviors would be outlawed if it were enacted, okay? It is already illegal for producers to coordinate so as to fixing prices, something Harris also separately said she plans to tackle tackle through harsher penalties price gouging is something different than that but it also seems sometimes to be used to refer to a very ne narrow set of practices like increasing the prices the day after a hurricane while other times being used to refer to anytime sellers increase prices during a positive demand shock or a negative supply shock which is kind of how a lot of the economy works when restaurants increase prices after happy hour they are are they engaged in food price gouging a better idea would be for the federal government to spend about 45 billion to purchase kroger this will allow it to directly set the price for the second largest grocery store chain in the country. He's not wrong. I mean, but this is a bit of a fucking meme. Your boss, Amazon, is one of the biggest culprits in price gouging. I agree. I know. I know. Which is why I love Lena Khan. Uh, and also, they should tackle that as well. He's not wrong. This would be the most effective way of, like, out-competing. This would be the most effective way of out-competing everybody else. He's right about this. Except... That would, I think, terrify people. <laughs> I wish they would do it, though. That would be great. There's also a wording issue on here. It's not a ban on price gouging. It's a plan to give the regulatory boards additional resources and power to investigate potential cases of price gouging on, upon suspicion of price gouging. It's not a China-style ban in terms of if you increase the prices by more than 5%, we will execute the shareholders. Okay, that's not my expectation anyway. Okay. Capping out of pocket spending on drugs at 2000. This is a good idea, assuming it's well designed. Read David Trimmer on it here. 6K tax credit for newborns. This is basically a good idea. It's sometimes called a baby bonus or maternity grant. Ideally, you would not design this as a tax credit, but instead a straightforward cash grant paid out by Social Security Administration. In other countries, maternity grants like this are even provided a couple months before birth so that the money can be used for various baby related items. Paying it out as a tax credit generally means parents won't be able to access it until early parts of the year after they give birth. Assuming they file for taxes, which is the poor, which the poorest parents do not do. 3K child tax credit. The current child tax credit is 2,000 per child. It has a phase in that includes the poorest kids and a phase out that excludes the richest kids. 
It is paid out in a lump sum at the end of the year. For one year in 2021, the trial tax credit was 3000 per child, had no phase in, and was paid out monthly. This basic idea of this was good, but the execution of it as an IRS-administered monthly advance refundable tax credit was bad. Among other things, it caused poor people to not get the benefit, as I wrote about extensively in 2021. A better idea would have the Social Security Administration pay a monthly cash benefit to every child. Uh, I, I don't disagree with that either. Increased subsidies for individual health insurance plans. It is hard to assess this idea without first observing the entire structure of how we do health insurance is so unbelievably awful at all anyone should want to do is completely overhaul it i 100 percent agree with that but it seems like democrats basically are content with gradually adding more and more subsidies to help relatively small percentage of the population who buy insurance plans from the individual exchanges it's fine nationalizing grocery stores is a good idea to expose americans to i i cannot begin to admit how much i agree with that sentiment okay i I'm telling you right now, there are already mechanisms in play that are investigating Kroger and many other am Amazon and many other fucking grocer chains in terms of like increasing par uh, prices, artificially utilizing the additional level of utilizing all of the extra information that you have, like the McDonald's app, okay? Using like uh, price adjustments. This is all already happening. This is many invisible ways in which people don't even fucking recognize that you're being gouged, okay? It is crazy. Like, these applications, like Uber, already fucking do it. Like, for example, I'm willing to bet that I, someone who obviously has, uh, you know, no reason not to fucking care about, like, price hikes on Uber in, like, times of need surge pricing for example i'm always i'm not even looking at it i'm clicking go right so uber knows that so they serve me higher prices no matter what and not from like uber black versus uber x i mean straight up my uber x is probably on average more expensive than your uber x on average even if we lived in the same fucking neighborhood and even if we used uber at the same time there is an algorithm on the back end that literally looks at the likelihood that you will pay more and then serves you higher prices every time. It happens with Uber Eats. It happens with Uber. It happens with all of these applications. And it certainly happens, this, co this concept called dynamic pricing certainly happens with every single application. It is a crazy way in which it's not a flex chatters. Oh my God. Can we please be adults for like three seconds we're talking about some real nerdy shit that impacts your lives holy fuck dude i'm literally explaining something that you're probably oblivious to and you're over here being like fuck weird flex dog it's like shut up just listen okay as it stands a lot of corporations utilize all of the cookies and all of the information that your fucking phone is feeding these applications as as more and more of our shopping turns online as more and more of our shopping is conducted over our phones that captures every minute detail of your daily existence these applications engage in what is known as dynamic pricing at first it makes it seem like it's a way to offer cheaper goods okay but the reality down the line is that they will figure out exactly when you are more likely to fucking buy shit and they'll pump you they will increase your prices, okay? Here it is. David Dayen wrote extensively on this. Yes, I'm exact, this is exactly what I was referencing. One person, one price. Digital surveillance and customer isolation are individualizing the prices we pay, okay? Uber is also locking drivers out of the app during certain times to increase the demand artificially, thereby increasing the prices so ridiculous and insane and harmful to the drivers as well as those who work these hours to make their money. It's corporations determining your propensity to consume the goods slash product and maximizing how much profit they can extract out of you without turning you away. Yes. Is there something we could do to avoid dynamic pricing? Yes. Uh, the administration, if you make a large enough stink about it, will uh, use mechanisms that already are in place from the FTC to put an end to it. Okay. There's also something you can do through the legislative agenda, but I don't think that's likely. I'll be real with you. Yeah, Burger Kings and McDonald's control many prices in a sneaky way, knowing exactly when they're fucking, when every individual's, like, highest likelihood to pay more money is. They know when you get, they, they look at, they look at your propensity and your likelihood to consume more, like, when you get your fucking check, 
okay? They know uh, they know if you're getting paid just off of, here's how the algorithm works, okay? Simply off of how much more likely you are to consume, they know exactly when you're getting payday, okay? And in that situation, right after payday, they will slightly adjust prices. They will slightly adjust prices and increase them in an effort to, to get you to pay higher prices than you normally would. It's fucking nutty. How crazy is that? It's happening in invisible ways, but obviously because it happens over the course of your day, numerous times a day, in every single uh, thing that you're purchasing, uh, it adds up and it has a tendency to greatly fucking uh, greatly increase the price of consumer goods in general. Okay. What was your solution to the issue with the 25k home buyer policy? Oh, I'll explain. 25k first time home buyer policy is like populist, not the best solution. The best solution is something else that they've also suggested, which is, uh, which is opening up 3 million additional housing units, which is nowhere near enough. But overall, I think that there's a little bit that I agree with the Yimbies on this, where, you know, uh, some of the zoning restrictions are completely unnecessary, especially in high density areas like fucking San Francisco, for example. Okay. Um, high density housing is definitely a, a necessity in a lot of these places. I don't mind it. I think it's a good thing. Uh, deregulation of housing construction, on the other hand, can mean something very nefarious and very dangerous. When, for example, Trump talks about that, I get a little scared because I don't think he's talking about fucking single family zoning being abolished or whatever. I think he's talking about fucking putting up silly putty houses. Okay. That's one. That's one. Number two. And this is perhaps the most significant. This is perhaps the most significant way to solve the housing crisis, which is public housing, social housing, council housing. If you're British, that's how you call it. Yeah, lad. Council fucking housing, council flats, mate. Council fucking flats, mate. The government needs to step in and create a competitive product that will deflate the actual existing housing prices. Sorry. It's just fucking unacceptable. I know this guy said, made a snide remark. I said, no more gated mansions. Yeah, you're right, dude. It's, it's me. I'm the problem. You're right. I, the one guy who owns a house who regularly advocates to lower the value of this house that I have, I'm your fucking enemy. You're right. There has never been a moment where I have not been an advocate and have not been a fucking full-blown, full-blown fighter for opening up additional housing units, not in the form of fucking ADUs, by the way, not like every single homeowner becomes a landlord type shit, but straight up, straight up an advocate for socialized housing. It's ridiculous. Huh. It's also funny because like, it's also funny because like, I'm not an elected representative. So like, I have no power over this, but the marginal influence uh, I do have, I use it to advocate for the right things. You'd pay less taxes on your house, though? Bitch, are you kidding me? Do you think that is a consideration for me? What the fuck are you talking about? My house, like, my house price goes up regardless, okay? Whether or not, uh, no matter what I say or do, my housing price goes up, okay? It just goes up because there is a finite amount of land and people are not using it in the appropriate ways they should be and there is simply, um, there is a, there is an attitude in the United States of America that like home ownership is an investment vehicle and not necessarily, and not necessarily a place that you live in. Okay, it's such a cliche insult at this point. I know. I don't know if people have ever looked at your housing prices, but how the fuck did you get a nice house in LA for only two point seven mil? That's like the cost of a fucking three bedroom apartment is actually insane. No, my house was actually, uh, my house was literally for the rest of the fucking area that I live in was actually super cheap per, uh, per square foot, which is an unimaginable thing to say when you think about like how actually normal of a fucking house it is in, in terms of like a single family house. And also I had great timing. Yeah. Well, my great timing was deliberate. I knew that fucking, they were going to increase interest rates. So I bought it ahead of that and I leased a car ahead of that too.
This is 1000% going to get weirdly clipped. I know, I know, but it doesn't matter because it's just the fucking truth. People think I live in like a fucking massive gorillion dollar mansion. There's like 20 houses for every homeless person. So it's not a supply issue. It's a distribution issue. There is that problem as well. You're absolutely correct on that because people look at housing as a speculative asset. People look at housing as a vehicle of investment and not something that is shelter and a necessity for people, people's survival. Crozier is replacing paper tags with electronic uh, ones so they can just have an algorithm change in the price whenever. Imagine if you were Stacy with an olive oil for $15 a good deal so the label shows up. That, that to her, but 17 to me when I walk by, that's where we're headed. Do not shop at places with e-label chat. I mean, it's going to be impossible to avoid that, dude, eventually. How the fuck are you leasing a car? That's just a horrible use of money. It's an electric vehicle. There is no reason to fucking purchase an electric vehicle. Everybody always roasts me the fucking for leasing a goddamn EV. But so wait, I thought you bought the take in. You're telling me all those nice car Andy's are mad about a lease. Yes. Okay. The $2.1 billion dollar machine fern video, McDonald's machine fern video goes over exactly this. Yeah. Wait, why only leasing an EV? Have you seen what fucking prices look like for an electric vehicle? It's already, it's a new market for, it's a new market in general, new technology, new innovative ways, completely fucking write off older models like that. There's also battery life, uh, lifespan issues in general. Um, I think that that is, and it's also super expensive unnecessarily. So now people are mad. You didn't pay cash out of pocket. I know that's why I leased my EV. If you want to replace the EV battery, it's like just buying a new car. Exactly. Chad not knowing the take hands after Hassan's lease their his under the ocean right now. Yeah. Lease didn't, didn't even get the turbo S broke ass millionaire. Okay, bro. Well, whatever. I, I think that it was a good it was a it was a good thing to do, even though my brother and all my friends, like my fucking finance friends, some of my best friends in finance, still yell at me about that decision every fucking day. Anyway. You're at my I still think it was the right move, but what the fuck do I know? I'm an idiot. Okay. <clears throat> there are various reasons to make leasing a car a good choice in the right circumstance. Okay. Um, yeah. Harris plans to ban grocery price gouging. What does the evidence say? Price increases when demand exceeds supply or textbook economics. The question is whether and how much the pandemic yielded the excess take. So your brother got scholarship, right? NASA probably paid handsomely to get him. None of those things happened. His scholarship was called having an older brother who won the fucking lottery by being a Twitch streamer that became successful, who paid off all of his student loan debt. I'm NASA, motherfucker. It's Hassa. Hassa Abbey. Yeah, Nepo brother. Okay, let's continue. Um, mm, 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 mm. All right. Let's hear what the Republicans have to say about this. Only debuting her economic platform in a few hours. It's got new tax credits, costly support, costly support for first-time home buyers, and a federal ban on quote price gouging. Harris specifically calls out grocery stores taking advantage of Americans. But look at this: retailers reporting profit margins at 1.6 percent. Dude, this is fucking insane. Okay, this is actually insane, bro. Bro, like. Here, let's look at this. Let's look at this. It, in with respect to like all the other uh price of consumer goods and their profit margins, okay? Ah, uh, the economic genius is Brian Kilmeade. Yeah. Sometimes you hear but grocery is a low margin business, and I think the correct thing to say is it was a low margin business until the pandemic. One thing that has been notable about grocery prices during the pandemic is that their earnings behavior has been empirically different from the rest of retail. Whereas margins in other retail popped fast, then came back down. Grocery margins rose slowly and have stayed stubbornly, uh, stubbornly high. Factors like avian flu and substitution towards high margin store brand products may have had some effect during this time, but this is a larger, more persistent shift than I would have expected from just those temporary peripheral factors. Just steal groceries, simple. People do that. And that's why, that's why shrinkage has increased while profit margins have stayed up. Why? Because the pesky incredibly costly part of the grocery business is obviously hiring people. How does shrink increase? Well, you no longer have cashiers operating cash registers and you have self checkout with self checkout comes more opportunities to steal and many people do it, but that's still baked into their profit margins because even though shrink goes up, 
you now no longer have to pay people's health insurance. You now no longer have to pay people's salary. You know now you now no longer have to pay people in general. Okay? This is a mathematical equation that they've engaged in and they know that. And that's why I laugh whenever people say organized retail theft is responsible for $1 billion or billions of dollars in fucking uh, theft every year. You're a fucking dumbass if you believe that. You literally are contributing to the shrink more than fucking organized retail theft. They're not stealing fucking enriched uranium, okay? They're stealing, they're, they're stealing fucking groceries and, and things that are like $8, okay? You fucking dummies. Do you know how much organized retail theft has to happen for that, uh, for that to actually make a dent in shrink? That's insane. They're fucking steal people. You're stealing it. Like you're contributing to the shrink more than organized retail theft is when you go to the fucking grocery store and you sneak into your bag, a fucking Reese's cup. Okay. That's literally happening way more frequently and across the board, that actually contributes to the shrink. And it doesn't matter because that still actually is not reflected in their profit margins because it's still cheaper for them to hire less people and just eat the fucking cost of people stealing shit overall. Huh. 5% being the lowest. I wonder we can't feed people. Maybe AI will fix this. Yeah. Look at this shit, dude. Retail trade margins by subsector. Fucking boom. All other retail explodes. Okay dips back normalizes a little bit but still rate it's still rising steadily whereas um whereas food and beverage retail um big bump okay another massive big bump dip another massive fucking bump and just continues people weighing their own hot bar salad food bar self-checkout is massive at whole foods yeah these people don't think these grocery stores have cameras. They just act like they don't care because petty theft doesn't make a dent. It, if it made a difference, they'd prosecute en masse. Exactly. Shrink isn't even just theft. It accounts for products that spoil and other stuff too. Exactly. Exactly. Shrink has increased alongside more consumer goods being purchased. When foot traffic increases, shrink increases. It adjusts to more foot traffic. It adjusts to more consumer goods being purchased. That's all this is. There's breakage in the logistical in the in the supply chain that's a big part of shrink as well there's also theft of employees employees stealing shit as well that's also in shrink anyway wait you guys don't have security guards and helpers at checkout stations bro they don't have enough like what do you mean that's the whole that's the whole principle behind having one guy command like eight fucking self-checkout uh stations and he's not really there all the time anyway um but yeah Yeah, also people get paid too little to carry it. Imagine fucking, what are you going to do? You're going to fucking go Punisher mode on like a, a teenager for fucking shoplifting a Skittles? Like, what is wrong with you? Nobody gives a fuck, you know? No one's paid enough to care. Anyway, um, so that's always ironic when people talk about that shit. Really? Is that gouging? Former Trump chairman of the Council on Economic Advisors twice, Kevin Hassett joins us. Kevin, from what you see and from what's been framed out for us this morning, what will this do? Like for an economist, this is about the most terrifying proposal I've ever seen because what Kamala knew, Harris is saying is that the government needs to set the price of things. And she's starting with food, but I guess if they're going to set the price of food, they might as well set the price of everything else. They've also... Wait, first of all, we do set the price of food. Okay, make no mistake. Whenever someone who is an economist claims that the government doesn't set the price of food, they're lying. Okay, of course we set the price of food. Here's how we set the price of food currently. We set the price of food with farm subsidies and agricultural subsidies. That's number one. We also set the price of food by offering uh, welfare and economic help to those who work at places like fucking Walmart. Okay, okay. These are retailers that get billions of dollars of federal help to adjust their prices, adjust their wages as low as physically humanly possible without like literally killing their fucking employees. They do that. Okay. They do that on a daily fucking basis. This is simply asking for a return on that. Okay. If you're making an investment, it's perfectly valid for you to ask a return on that investment. Okay. It's ridiculous. I think the government should play fast and loose a little bit more. I think the government should play hardball a little bit more. Okay. That's all I want. Hey, Austin, I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to earn money. I'm a 27 year old living with 
Cerebral palsy at home and unable to work. My dad passed away from brain cancer 12 years ago. And since then, my mother and I have been moving from one family member to the next. So thank you again. Um, hell yeah, Chatter. I, I don't know. I, I assume you make like uh, you, you make money off of uh, Hassan Abbey Clips, right? I suspect it's a clip channel in the Hassan Abbey Clips industrial complex. Republicans fucking complained about prices as a political talking point over and over again. Especially because it was a real problem that a lot of people are experiencing. Kamala Harris acknowledged the problem, said she's going to solve it, and now they're complaining. Now they're complaining that they're, they're, that they're solving the fucking problem. It's like, what do you want? What the fuck do you want? About, you might recall uh, the Biden administration saying that they want to set rents. Uh, they think rents are too high, so they're going to have the government decide what the rent for your apartment should be. Oh, my God. I would nut if they did that. That'd be so fucking sick. Jesus Christ, they should literally do that. Holy fuck. This is absolute socialism, and, and it never ends well. If you go back and look at the countries that have tried this, like... They want not a black person to do it? Nah, it's not that. They, they just... They want Trump to win for that reason as well as other reasons, but, like, it's, it's also because, like, these guys... You have to remember, there's a higher order than even white supremacy here, okay? White supremacy is a very powerful motivator, but the highest order is still capitalism. Okay. So that's it. They'll say Vuvuzela is coming. They're going to say the V word. Trust me. It's coming. They're going to say the M word Maduro. And they're going to say Vuvuzela is coming. Cuba, Venezuela, Ukraine, uh, back when the Soviet Union organized it, then it leads to famine and shortages. And I was just in Lisbon, Portugal, where they still have really a a aggressive rent control. And all of the apartments are empty because the people who own the buildings can't afford to rent them to people because Dude, dude, talking about former Soviet Republic nations and housing in, in such places is such a funny fucking thing to bring up because they literally have like 80, 90% homeowner uh, rates, okay? It's actually insane to bring that up. Quite literally the exact opposite of the reality that he is mentioning, Okay. The rent is so low. And so this is an absolute disaster. Right. This is socialism at its highest. And, and the really chilling thing is that, think about it, it's right before the Democratic... Yeah, Nat I don't know about the Portugal part. I don't know. He just knocked that in there. Social ...convention. She's the nominee. She uh, should be trying to moderate her... All former socialists and socialist countries have high home ownership rate above 90%. Cuba, China, Vietnam, Laos, Pol uh, Poland, Russia, former Soviet republics, Albania, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, and all countries of ex-Yugoslavia. Home ownership in the DPRK is 99.8%, according to some sources. I mean, I don't know about DPRK, but like, because I just don't know uh, if there's reliable data from DPRK. But ultimately, you're right. A lot of these former Soviet nations have incredibly high homeownership rates in comparison to the United States of America. The United States of America is still relying on the GI Bill and other additional social safety nets that made homeownership a reality for many Americans that that is the reason why there's still a relatively higher home ownership rate in the United States of America than you would think. I believe it's around 60% or so. Because you would probably assume if you're younger, if you're, if you're under the age of like 45, home ownership rate is nothing, okay? So you think that's laughable. You're like, what? Home ownership rate for who? But in the United States of America, it's still around 65%, something around that. Um, and that is because... Homes used to be affordable, and also there was a lot of help for home ownership in general. But of course, with with every other aspect of the American economy, uh, many people that took many people took advantage of the loopholes, or uh, rather, the help that people got. Ninety nine percent of home ownership of shitholes. What? That's not true, though. What's the quality of those homes? Okay. That is some freak behavior, okay? The idea that you're like, oh, it must be a shithole is just American exceptionalism and copium at the highest degree. And I know for a fucking fact that this dingus does not own a home. So why the fuck are you chirping, dumbass, okay? You will never be able to buy a home. So why the fuck are you literally advocating against your best interest here, okay? What a stupid fucking argument. I am not American and I home a, own a home in France. Oh my God, dude. Homes in ex-socialist countries are shit. Not recognizing, not recognizing that a lot of the home ownership price adjustments come from actual fucking, actual working class fighting 
to ensure that the prices are normal, okay? Still benefiting from that, still benefiting from that in a place like France, and then chirping about America is hilarious, okay? See yourself out of this fucking uh, conversation, dumbass. I've already brought up the example in the United States of America, okay? For example, the United States of America having 65% home ownership, French home price normal. I don't know if I can have this conversation with you, man. I just, I don't know. I don't know how you will understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. Maybe because English is not your first language. You're just having a hard time comprehending the things that I'm saying. Okay. Let me explain something to you. Let me explain something to you. Okay. Every reason as to how you were able to purchase a home, barring like some, you know, other reason because you were like the son or daughter of a very wealthy person is a direct consequence of some sort of market regulation, socialization, okay? Initiatives that were in place many, many years prior to you ever purchasing a home. Any reason as to why you're now complaining about home ownership being unaffordable is a direct consequence of the for-profit uh, attitudes that are in the sector of home ownership. In the United States of America, the argument that I was trying to present the fact that there is still a 65% homeownership rate is a direct consequence of prior socialization initiatives, okay? It's additionally funny to say this when your own fucking government tries to actively readjust pricing by pouring billions into fucking public housing. One quarter of residents in the French capital live in government-owned housing, part of an aggressive plan to keep lower-income Parisians and their businesses in the city. There is, no, there is no place on the planet that is... There are very few places on the planet outside of the United States of America where there's like high-density uh, population centers where housing prices have skyrocketed in a similar capacity. Canada is one example of this, of course. All of those, all of those places have completely unshackled and unrestricted home ownership and have caused uh, housing prices to skyrocket and make it incredibly unaffordable. Okay? The way to combat that still absolutely stems from good public uh, policies like public housing. Huh. I'm not a son, but very lucky and privileged. Most people my age can't afford a home I bought. And I 100% agree with you about home prices going up because it's like greed and speculation. That being said, most people own a house in ex-USSR countries, own in majority houses made in the 50s, which are crumbling. Brother, you do understand that ultimately being able to own a house is still better than being homeless, right? I think we agree. Being able to own a house is still better than fucking being a permanent renter. And the only way to arrive at that is with these kinds of initiatives. So why the fuck are you chirping and coping and being like, oh, well, their houses suck shit, though. Also, it is additionally ironic that you're talking about how those homes were built in the fucking 50s or whatever. What do you think has happened in the United States of America, especially in a place like Los Angeles, California, where there isn't a lot of weather conditions that ruin the available housing inventory? Most of our houses are also built in the fucking 50s. Anyway, there is no world, there is nowhere on this planet in which housing prices have just like you know, increased on its fucking own without any sort of, and the government tried to like set initiatives. The government tried to uh, decrease, decrease the, 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 the price of housing units by offering additional social housing and, and failed to do so. Okay. As a matter of fact, if you look at places like England, for example, places like London, where housing is completely out of control, housing prices are completely out of control. It is a direct consequence of, Thatcher's policies of selling off council housing, social housing, and privatizing pre-existing units that once were controlled by the government. Okay? I want you all to selfishly have houses for yourself. I want there to be social housing so you have additional income to spend at the top of the hour in order to afford the, afford the $6 a month Top of the hour avoidance fee in the form of a subscription. If you no longer want to see the ads at the top of the hour, which are three minutes long, that is what you need to do. You need to 
purchase a subscription for $6. You can also get one for free in the form of a Twitch Prime. Twitch Prime is free as long as you have an Amazon Prime account connected to your Twitch account where you get one free Prime subscription a month. Here's a three-minute ad break. Now you can also get gifted a sub. Stop saying I fumbled the delivery. It's hard to talk sometimes. Let's get back to Kevin Hassett positions to appeal to swing voters and instead she's going all in on socialism so what it means is these people really are that way these people really believe in socialism they want to change this country and they're willing to say it you know up front right sure. now and it, it's astonishing to me that she would do that but Kevin here's how you could spin it don't you care about first-time home buyers don't you care that people have health care debt <laughs> don't you care that students have uh, we, people in the workplace have student loans and if you don't you have no heart you don't care about people you only like rich people that's the spin for people that want to push back right. on what she's presenting. Right, and, and the way to respond to that is to say that, geez, you know, if you create a, a happy business environment, then people get jobs, they have high incomes, and they can afford stuff. If you want people to have cheap uh, places to live, then you should stop, like, uh, uh, the expansion or encourage the expansion of uh, building into parts of the city that aren't zoned to have houses and then you increase the supply of houses there are a lot of things that you could do that make economic sense that help these folks and it's not just having the government set things whenever the government set things and what happens is that if you're friends with Hillary Clinton and Kamala Harris then they're gonna be sure that the prices for your stuff are they're really good and if there's a shortage you're gonna get it but if you're an ordinary folk then you're gonna go to the grocery store right. and it's gonna be kind of like the the drugstore where, where you got to go find someone to get you the razor blades because they're behind lock and key. There's going to be shortages and it's going to be hard to get stuff and the, and the shelves are going to be empty. Make no mistake, in socialist country, the shelves are empty in the stores and that's the country that Kamala Harris wants to give us. There's something really funny about this argument because like we're a capitalist country and that's happening. We are the most capitalist country and that's happening. So I guess it has nothing to do with anything that you're saying. And there's some mythical socialist country. Like you think that's happening in China, bro? China's socialist, right? Like, you think that's happening? You think that's happening in China? So much of this, so much of this quite literally is pointing to, like, things that are happening under capitalism and being like, guys, this is positively socialist. Look at all this socialism. It's like, bitch, they're trying to address the problem now. Fixed margins for necessities, including foods, rent, healthcare, nationalized grocery, like the government, military, commissary, raise the minimum wage, Yim B&B build housing, bike lanes, and public transit. How good is the standard of life in China? Pretty fucking good. Especially if you live in the cities. It's funny because, like, it didn't used to be. And a lot of people are still operating with, like, old school attitudes. Like, guys, I don't think people understand, like, we had a medal drama going on. China tied with us for the number of gold medals at the Olympics. America still won in the overall medal count. But ultimately, China tied with the number of gold, and we're defeating our asses, actually, throughout the duration of the Olympics. Okay? Very different world that we live in now. Very different world that we live in now. Okay? That's like one silly metric of success. One silly metric of success to look at overall. But, like, the idea, like, when you look at, when you look at, like, the Chinese education system, when you look at all these other things, like social safety nets and whatnot, there's still issues in China specifically in terms of healthcare and whatnot. Okay. China won because of Taiwan and Hong Kong. <laughs> I don't, I don't think they add the, the Taiwan medals onto Chinese medals, but if they do, yes, then they did win. We're going to tattoo show up owned by a Chinese national. My coworker just arrived from Shanghai four months ago. His accounts of his life in China is as far as standard of living, make us look like pure shit. He's struggling to adjust because he's finding that none of his bases provided by the Chinese government are in effect here. Yeah, the greatest lie ever told uh, to the American population, I think, is this, like, false notion that um, Americans, one, don't pay a lot in taxes. Um, what they don't realize is, like, our government provides nothing, okay? In comparison to every other country, there are so many things that the government actually makes cost efficient. So many things that the government actually regulates. So many things that governments actually uh, make cheap, okay? Yeah, sure. Like uh, people also people think that they pay fucking significantly more in taxes too. It's not necessarily that they pay significantly more in taxes. Uh depending on obviously higher earners, they do, okay? But even as if, even when you live in a place like California, if you're in the top of the mar top margin uh in the tax bracket like myself, I'm paying fucking France style taxes. I'm paying European taxes. 
and I get nothing in return for it. I got nothing to show for it, okay? Because most of that is just still going to America's superiority in the form of military all around the world. It's going to America's military allies. Yeah, it's great, man. I love, I love when my taxes go to finding new ways of melting brown children, you know? It's the sickest. I feel so safe and so good. You want a free market or you don't? People need to explain that. Uh, when they asked, uh, Fox News asked people, who do you trust in the economy? It's still Trump 52, 46, a little bit closer than it was under Joe Biden. When also, when she talks about, oh, I'm for fracking. Ooh, that's scary. Fracking down for offshore drilling. But there's a way to be subtly against it. And that's through regulations. That's through maximizing. Military spending is a small fraction of government spending. Okay, cut it out then. If it's a small fraction, just cut it out. Now, here's the thing. Here's the other part of this uh, conversation. First of all, discretionary spending, you're absolutely wrong. But as far as, as far as like overall spending goes, a lot of that goes to social security and social safety nets that exist. But there's another fucking problem here that many people fail to recognize. We do also have an auditing issue in the government, okay? The American government is insanely fucking wealthy. And as, it, as uh, it is insanely fucking wealthy, we just dump boatloads into the fucking private sector. We dump boatloads into the goddamn private sector to make up for all of these areas, all of these areas that the government is supposed to be taking care of, okay? Yeah, we have the highest military spending worldwide, but that's, not, that's neither here nor there, okay? The issue is... A lot of this stuff is supposed to be handled by the government, but we don't, we are allergic. We are fucking outright allergic to having the government manage any of this shit. And then we consistently talk about how the government bureaucracy is getting in the way of innovation or government bureaucracy is getting in the way of fucking this or that. It's like all of that stuff is still handled by the private sector. We just dump fucking truckloads of money to the private sector and expect the private sector to fix these fucking problems. And of course, nobody wants to fix the fucking problems, especially when they're literally tied to other private sector interests in order to not solve these problems. The greatest example of this is in like a state like California, where we where we outsource all of these problems in the state to private sector operatives, and they never actually fucking build additional housing units or build homeless shelters or whatever the fuck. And they just park all those assets. Why? Because on the other side, they're benefiting from the, uh, they're benefiting completely from the lack of housing supply. It's a much or much higher order of priority for them to ensure that there is no additional housing supply, to ensure that there's no fucking additional shelters or whatever, because that might actually, God forbid, lead to uh, some of the home prices going down. Holy shit, we can't have that. That's one of the biggest issues with the American private-public partnership attitude that we have. Another great example of this is when you look at places like fucking West Virginia. When you look at when you look at the the Appalachian region, right? I used to be a hate watcher, but I've turned a new leaf. I'm from West Virginia. It's so irritating to have a conversation about why we're poor with anyone. Today I had to explain to my mom how the pharma companies work and how more taxes are good and we should tax the rich. I don't think she even cared because my parents are so brain rotted. Funny that you said West Virginia, because I was just talking about West Virginia. Let's talk about West Virginia. Okay. People in the mountains are not like weird mountain people with a different brain than the rest of the white population. Those are areas that used to have industry, okay? And at the time, the American government, instead of offering services to those people, left it up to the specific sectors to take care of the people, okay? They even gave them subsidies to take care of those people. So what happened when automation kicked in or what happened when those very same corporations realized that they could extract higher profit margins if they were to move their businesses uh, elsewhere, okay? They created maybe not company towns directly, okay? But something resembling company towns. That's why so much of, so much of like the public safety nets that would exist in these regions were directly sponsored by the companies, okay? If you go to any fucking Rust Belt, if you go to any Rust Belt town that is now decrepit, Okay, it's basically a fucking ghost town. You will see, like, still, General Electric, General Motors, like these brands that no longer exist there, okay? They used to fucking, they, the school was sponsored by them, the roads were fucking sponsored by them. Like, all of these, 
all of these towns were basically created because the industry was there. Once they moved out, nothing remains. Okay? Nothing remains. These aren't directly company towns in the way that you understand it. Obviously, I'm not talking about like Henry Ford style company towns, but like these were towns created by the companies and then they fucking moved on when they couldn't, when they could get profit elsewhere because they have no responsibility to the citizens in the same way that the government does. Okay? Why the fuck would they stay there? They care about one thing and one thing only, which is profit, increasing profit margins at any fucking cost. It doesn't have to be Fordlandia chatter. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have to be directly a fucking company town in the way that like Henry Ford tried to try to do it. I'm saying that like they built entire towns and the government was like, it's great. It's great. They're, they're taking care of this in our stead. So let's just let them take care of it. Another example for Appalachia is Walmart, right? Walmart comes in. Walmart prices out every fucking family-owned grocery store. You can't compete with fucking Walmart. Walmart then hires a bunch of people at the lowest possible cost that they can hire people because why else would they, uh, you know, of course they're going to do that. Walmart relies heavily on government subsidies. Once, once Walmart decides, eh, it's no longer profitable for us to even maintain this fucking store, they fuck off. Now you have eviscerated the entire ecosystem, okay? You just gutted what remained of the grocery stores that were family owned and operated. You came in, you did predatory pricing, you destroyed them, and then you fucked off. So now you have a food desert. You have a massive food desert. What are these people supposed to do? The, the, family, -owned, the family owned grocery store is gone. What are they supposed to do? Anyway, Dollar Store, Dollar, Dollar General is usually guilty of this as well. Yeah, Dollar, Dollar General is what remains after Walmart is done gutting your fucking town. Okay? And they're bad too. Iris plans to ban grocery price gouging. What does the evidence say? The message polls well with swing voters. It has been embraced by progressive groups, which regularly appoint the price gouging as a driver of rapid inflation or at least something that contributes to rapid price increases. These groups cheered the announcement late Wednesday that Ms. Harris would call for a federal ban on corporate price gouging on groceries in an economic policy speech. Um, what Israel has announced operations in Gaza have largely ended. It's news to me. Yeah, here, here it is here. Radiating death. How Walmart displaces nearby small businesses. The closer they are, the more they fall and then they fuck off. Okay. But hey, keep paying attention to like, you know, El Salvador is coming over the fucking border. They're the ones who are robbing you blind, right? Not these fucking guys. Anyway. But the economic argument over the issue is complicated. Economists have cited a range of forces for pushing up prices in the recovery from the pandemic recession, including snarled supply chains, a sudden shift in consumer buying patterns, and the increased customer demand fueled by stimulus from the government and low rates from the Federal Reserve. Most economists say these forces are far more responsible than corporate behavior for the rise in prices in that period. But Biden administration economists have found that corporate behavior has played a role in pushing up grocery costs in recent years, but, but that other factors have played a much larger role. The Harris campaign announcement on Wednesday cited meat industry consolidation as a driver of excessive grocery prices, but officials did not respond on Thursday to questions about the evidence Ms. Harris would cite on how her proposal would work. There are examples of companies telling investors in recent years that they have been able to raise prices to increase profits, but even the term price gouging means different things to different people. To some, it means companies are using shortages as an opportunity to raise prices rapidly, taking advantage of an imbalance between supply and demand to rake in huge profits. That kind of behavior is common, even expected, in economics and tends to crop up when products become hard to get. Okay? For others, price gouging suggests that companies are choosing to produce less, effectively keeping something in short supply so they can charge more. At least in theory, such a situation should only be temporary. New competitors should enter the market and provide products at a uh, price people can afford. And some seem to use the term to mean that companies have been taking advantage of a moment of rapid inflation to pass through price increases of their own. Okay. Prices jumped starting in 2021 as factory shutdowns and supply chain problems caused shortages for some products, including cars and furniture. At the same time, the pandemic relief checks and shifts in consumer behavior tied to the pandemic helped fuel hot consumer demand for physical goods. What? How, would, how down would you be if meat industry halved itself? Less beef, pork, chicken? First of all, it don't matter what the price of chicken is, okay? For me, I'm paying it no matter what. Do you understand? I still need to eat, big dog. 
I got to fuel these bad boys. Okay. So that's number one. I don't care about the beef part of the things. I'm made up of mostly chicken. Some people just said 50%. It's actually not 50%. Let me tell you. Okay. It's more than that. Inflation remained rapid in 2022, compounded by the start of Russia's war in Ukraine, which helped push up fuel and food prices. That year and in early 2023, it spread into a variety of service prices. The price jumps were essentially painful in categories like groceries at their peak in August 2022. Prices for food at home climbed 13.5% compared to a year earlier. And that matters to the typical household and voter. Economic research suggests the cost of groceries, which consumers buy regularly, seeing clearly posted prices, plays a hefty role in shaping Americans' views of inflation. But inflation has been slowing markedly over the past year and is now nearly back to its pace before the pandemic. Consumer price index climbed 2.9% in the year through July. Data this week showed the first time inflation has dipped below 3% since 2021. Okay. But inflation has been, um, as economists revisit why inflation reached such rapid pace at its peak, some point to price gouging. It is clearly the case that corporate profits picked up sharply during the pandemic and throughout 2022 and much of 2023, companies regularly talked about how much new pricing power they had and how they were trying to keep customers buying more premium um, uh, more premium products at heftier price points. Researchers at the Liberal Groundwork Collaborative in Washington produced a report in January calculating that corporate profit margins accounted for about half of American inflation in the second half of 2023, okay? But companies were able to rake in those profits for a reason. Some economists pointed out consumer demand was very strong. Fed and congressional efforts to boost households and businesses during the pandemic, like the $1,400 payments from individuals Mr. Biden signed as a part of the economic rescue plan, fueled consumption. If prices are rising on average over time and profit margins expand, that might look like price gouging, but it's actually indicative of a broad increase in demand. Yeah, it's just normal market, dude. It's just normal market. Yeah, people have more purchasing power, so we just keep prices high after, after getting like real hits to our supply, okay? And then having to increase prices to adjust to that due to increased demand, but then continuing to do so and continuing to keep prices high and even increasing it higher, I think is what the, the, I think that's what they're saying. They're, they're saying that that is normal market conditions and it's not price gouging. Whereas I think the Kamala Harris administration is going to consider that to be price gouging. He's written skeptically of claims that corporate behavior is driving prices higher. Such broad increases tend to be the result of expansionary monetary or fiscal policy or both. As hot demand collided with diminished supply, the economy operated more or less as one would expect, several economists said. Without enough goods to meet strong demand, companies began to charge as much as they could for what they did have to sell. Higher prices then proceed uh, product companies to produce more, which helps supply to recover and inflation to cool again. Egg prices went up last year because there weren't as many eggs and it caused more egg production, said Jason Furman, a Harvard economist formerly in the Obama Omna administration. And even when it came to things like groceries, the jump in prices wasn't all about corporate profits. The pandemic also spurred a rise in nominal worker wages, which has contributed to price increases. Researchers from the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City reported last year the rapid job growth in the U.S. economy and the wage increase that came with it were major contributors to rising grocery prices. Yeah, that's crazy because uh, wage increases did not actually keep up with uh, the, the uh, increases in prices. So I don't know what the fuck they're talking about there. I love this article because it blames virtually everyone but the companies responsible for the price hikes. It's like workers are at fault, okay, because their wages increased. Uh, consumers are at fault because they had more purchasing power. The government printed more money, so now consumers had more money. So then they just went out and they bought the, the pesky little chickens and the eggs, okay? It's the chickens that are at fault. And then when you like dive into the individual price hikes for things like eggs, you realize that like the avian flu did not even harm the largest fucking egg producer in the country. And yet they still increased their prices. Why the fuck did that happen? It almost feels like they saw that and then they increased it in the same way that your landlord goes, well, market conditions dictate that I can now charge you more for the same fucking housing unit. So sorry, your rent went up by 25%. It's just normal market conditions. So if these guys, okay, if these guys are doing that shit, if they're doing that shit, uh, market rate, nothing I can do, market conditions, either you, you know, 
change the market conditions by using the government and all of its powers to increase the rate of supply, okay? Or you institute price checks, uh, price caps at a certain point, or you go after, you go after people who are doing such things, okay? The damn market conditions never let my rent go down once. I know. It's crazy. Like, the egg producers were so nutty. 718% profit last year. 718% profit. They just got away with it. It was crazy. This is only one aspect of it. It's just the most simplistic way, though. Huh. <sighs> Yeah, others tweeted that simple economics and not greed were behind the rise in CalMain Foods revenue. One Twitter user wrote, sigh, it's simply supply, which is low right now, and demand, plus inflation. The price of eggs skyrocketed in December 2022 when a dozen large grade egg costs, grade A egg costs American consumers $4.25 on average. This is more than double what they paid a year before, an average of $1.79, according to data from U.S. Labor Department's Bureau of Labor Statistics. Since then, egg prices have gradually come down across the country, but they still remain much higher than they have been in the past decades. An upsetting change for such a well-loved, traditionally cheap stable. Owners literally admitted what they did and cucks are still slurping their cummies down and defending them. Yeah, it's great. And then they try to gaslight us like they weren't just gouging and manipulating prices. This is an older story though. Wait, US egg producers lose price fixing case. They engaged in conspiracy to reduce supply in an attempt to increase the price of eggs, a court ruled. Wait, isn't this the old? Yeah, this is from December, October 2004 to December 2008. Yeah. It's a new article, but it's actually talking about an older case. The problem with all of this, by the way, and this goes back to the FTC and trust busting, okay, is that corporate consolidation makes it easy, if not damn near the reality, that these guys don't even have to do price fixing. They don't even have to do price leadership. Okay, they can just simply set the price. That is the reason why you are supposed to go after monopolies. A government is supposed to do such things in an effort to ensure that it's not one fucking provider. Or if you're going to not go after monopolies, when industries do monopolize, take it over and nationalize it. Either put up a competitive product from the government when one of them is inevitably failing. Okay nationalize it in some capacity to have some kind of competitive way of deflating prices which is terrifying for obviously mega corporations they don't fucking want that at all okay that is precisely the reason why many sps have fought long and hard to make it illegal and have succeeded in making it illegal for the government to offer isp utility okay as a form of publicly owned utilities that are significantly better. That's why in places like uh, Chattanooga, right? Random places, they just have like incredible bandwidth. You're like, how the fuck did this happen? It's because they offer it as a public utility, okay? But they know, ISPs know that that is impossible to compete against and it forces them to literally fucking put up a competitive product that they don't want to do because they have to spend more money and that goes into their profit margins, they will instead petition the government to literally make this illegal and succeed, mind you. But up the road in Nashville, there's only AT&T and Comcast with a small block of Google Fiber. Exactly. I hate that. Yeah, Comcast and AT&T sued the city to prevent Google Fiber from expanding. And they do this shit all the fucking time. These are many ways, it, I know it sounds nerdy, it sounds maybe a little boring, but these are ways in which these mega corporations absolutely offer you an uncompetitive, shitty fucking product for higher and higher prices on a daily fucking basis. A reasonable government that actually, do, that actually does care about the interests of its citizens should be fighting tooth and nail against these mega corporations. But unfortunately, in the United States of America, that's why we joke about how the American government is not a government at all, but actually 50 companies in a fucking trench coat, okay? Every part of your life where there is a shitty-ass service that is getting increasingly worse as its prices go up, there is a mega corporation that lobbied the government actively to ensure that there is no competition in that field, okay? And the worst part of it is that these are industries 
that are natural monopolies too. Like massive amounts of infrastructure spending is a necessity for them to even exist, which is why it's already it's already naturally uncompetitive. Okay, but it doesn't fucking matter. I dare you to talk about Boeing law. Fuck you mean I shit on Boeing on a regular basis. Are you new here? Boeing is a great example of a company that has like made significantly worse products year over year over year as a direct consequence of, of the financialization of every company in the United States of America. Doesn't Murat work at Boeing? Yeah, he works at fucking Boeing. Exactly. He is a worker at Boeing. You think he's you think that like he's he's doing great? No. That money is not going back to the workers. I know that directly, okay? And shittification is a feature of capitalism. Yep. Shitting on Boeing is the most Boeing employee thing to do from a Boeing chatter. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever, like, talked to someone that actually works at fucking Boeing, but they'll very openly tell you that, like, you know, it's not exactly great. There's literally Boeing employees in the chat right now shitting on Boeing. They got no control over it. The fuck are they supposed to do? They don't make these decisions. Still, some economists suggest that in a world where supply shocks could be more frequent with causes like trade wars, geopolitical instability, and climate change, the government should find ways to prevent corporations from reacting to sudden supply shortages by sharply increasing prices. Isabella Weber, an economist at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, said that shortages in higher raw material costs during the pandemic seemed to work like a coordination tool. Many companies found that they could charge more because their competitors were doing the same. Hmm. Not price fixing, price leadership. Price leadership is so easy if you have an oligopoly, okay? Not a monopoly, but an oligopoly. You only have fucking, if you only have three, if you only have three fucking corporations, they don't need to sit in a fucking cigar, uh, cigar smoke filled shadowy back room making these deals. That would be illegal. That'd be price fixing. They can't do that. Ooh, that's illegal. No, no, no. But what they can do is look at, I don't know, the other leading competitor increasing their prices and go, oh shit, great, let's do that. And why the fuck wouldn't they? If there's no, re if there's no regulation that stops them from doing so, why the fuck wouldn't they do that? Who gives a fuck? It is, yeah, it is legal collusion. Price fixing is illegal. Price leadership is very legal. And if you have corporate consolidation, as is the case in almost every fucking sector in this goddamn country, because there's no trust busting, who's to say? Who's to say you can't do that? This is what a lot of people don't understand. Corporate consolidation at first is sold to the public with cheaper, more accessible consumer goods. Amazon does this. Amazon did this in e-commerce in general, right? Like, oh, dude, we can offer you cheap goods and reliable service. Delivery is super fast. It's more convenient. Come on now. And in the United States of America, we have set up our legal regulatory mechanisms to literally churn out this result. This is a shocking phenomena for many people where they're like, wait, what? Like, you mean to tell me that corporations can consolidate? They can actually engage in vertical and horizontal expansion, i.e., monopolization as long as the consumer is not harmed as in as long as prices don't increase but as a matter of fact are cheap and continue to be cheap yes the answer is yes you are not allowed to fucking trust bust if a actual corporation is monopolizing and keeping prices low but once they become a monopoly or an oligopoly they can slow and steadily offer you worse and worse service, drive wages down as best as possible, and also simultaneously give you worse product and increase the prices. And that's how you arrive at the fucking quadruple Monty that we're experiencing currently in the United States of America. That's how it works. That's how it's always worked in America. That's why you get shittier products. Uh, planned obsolescence and, and, you know, the same exact fucking good that's like a marginally improved year over year when, uh, you know, suspiciously when the fucking new iPhone comes around, all of a sudden the iPhone ain't working no more. How the fuck did that happen? That could set a worrisome precedent. Um, Isabella Weber, an economist at UMass Amherst, said the shortages in higher raw material costs that allowed them to maintain or even increase profits. That could serve as a worse and precedent. She said in future shocks, companies may not feel much urgency to rapidly fix supply chain problems, aware that they can pull in big profits in the meantime. 
This was additionally fucked up in this was additionally fucked up in the used car market and in the car market in general. They realized that they didn't have to retain any fucking inventory, which is costly, and just skyrocket prices. That shit was crazy. That shit was actually fucking crazy. That was one of the nuttiest parts of the pandemic where they literally would just be like, oh shit, what are you going to do? Not fucking buy a car? You need a car. There's no public transit. There's no competitive product that the government is supposed to offer you. So what are you going to do? Walk to work? No, you can't walk. There's no fucking sidewalks. You can't take the bus. There's no buses. What are you going to fucking do? You need a fucking car. Turns out when you need a fucking car, because there's no competitive, like anything offered by the government, all of a sudden, these motherfuckers don't even need to keep up the inventory. That's very costly. There's a risk there. When you have a large inventory, there's a risk. Maybe you can't sell out all the fucking cars, right? They realized they could just jack up the prices and maintain this fucking small inventory and boom, their, their profits skyrocket. And while the businesses are likely to ramp up production at lower prices in the long term, they would eventually face consumer pushback or lose out to competitors. Even a temporary period of very high inflation could be very tough on the average person. Oligopolies by nature create market inefficiencies for consumers. There's no incentive to sell at the market rate. Lack of competition gives no incentive to invest to become more innovative or competitive. Yes, this is all a part of the problem. Okay, on the fucking labor side, it's a massive issue when there's no competition. On the consumer side, it's a massive issue when there's no competition. You see it in the form of like massive fucking price hikes. It's just the gov when, when the American government has relied on the public profit sector partnership since its fucking inception with very little, with very little amenities, with very little actual public sector uh, help that other countries in Europe and, and elsewhere have offered, then there is no goddamn reason for uh, private companies to not do what they're doing right now. Like we're playing catch up right now with respect to Kamala Harris's like, price gouging initiatives okay we're simply playing catch up this is an absolute necessity because push has come to shove you know in the worst if the worst of times for ordinary people ends up being the best of times for some corporations she said people may feel cheated some sort of basic social contract a social contract is kind of crumpling it is she applauded Ms. Harris's plan to combat grocery price gouging. Mr. Furman, by contrast, said there was a risk that policies meant to curb corporate price gouging could instead keep the economy from adjusting. If prices do not rise in response to strong demand, new companies may not have had as much inclination to jump into the market to ramp up supply. This literally has not happened in America, and it literally does not happen. So why the fuck are you saying this? This is the worst part about fucking Econ Andes, okay? The worst part about Econ Andes is they are the ones who are fucking lying. They claim that um, socialists are just like lying about the economy. Oh, it's just fucking, you made that shit up. That's not how this works, okay? When in fact, they are the ones who are lying. They keep talking about a fucking thing that is not happening as though it should happen. They keep chirping about market conditions when normal market conditions just never exist, okay? If there was a regular supply demand curve, then there wouldn't be a multi-billion dollar industry that specifically is designed to make the average consumer make inefficient purchase decisions as a consumer. Okay, I'm talking about PR and marketing. That's not a, like, it's so fucking stupid. People don't make, if there were also normal market conditions, we'd have to factor in inelastic demand, for example. They never talk about that in terms of, they never talk about that in terms of like rational actors. This is not sensible policy. And I think the biggest hope is that it ends up being a lot of rhetoric and no reality. There's no upside here and there is some downside. Ugh. They do talk about inelastic demand, but their conclusion is we can charge more law. No, the econ Andes don't do it. Corporations are obviously very aware of inelastic demand. They abuse it on a daily fucking basis. Hassan, you would love to reach billionaire status, though. Don't lie. There is no different in there is no difference in my way of existence in what I do with the current amount of money I have versus a billion fucking dollars. Nothing would meaningfully change in my life. Nothing has meaningfully changed in my life 
outside of like the additional purchasing power that I have to to be able to improve. Yoke. Nothing is nothing is meaningfully changed in my life. I'm doing the exact same fucking shit that I was doing in 2020. Okay. A broke boy through and through streaming eight to fucking nine hours a day. And I'm doing that exact same fucking thing right now. The only thing that has changed is that I have all of these additional fears and all this additional weight that was on my shoulders on a daily fucking basis that you all experience once you become economically independent and no longer live with your fucking parents. The, the, the constant fucking specter that is haunting you at the end of the month where you're like, I need the budget. Can I actually pay for this Uber? Can I actually pay for these things that I want to fucking purchase for myself? I don't have to worry about those things. So it's a massive weight that is lifted off my shoulder. But that's why there's diminishing returns when you look at happiness and the amount of money that you're making once you reach a certain point of uh, financial freedom. Okay? That is a massive massive anxiety inducing thing that every single person carries with themselves on a day uh, on a daily basis but rich people are fucking lying to you when they make it seem like they just consistently have to make more fucking money okay they don't it's bullshit once you are at a point of financial freedom where you don't have to fucking worry about like rent or whatever when you don't have to worry about like utility bills and shit like that it's over Beyond that point, you don't need any fucking extra shit, okay? Look at that. That's freedom, baby. I mean, freedom you can have as well when you have, uh, when you are, you know, living with your parents. Just saying. Pretty fucking, pretty good. Uh, federal land and not letting people drill on it. There's a subtle way to hurt the oil and gas industry while not saying I want to ban on it, isn't there? Right. Well, also, if you look at the way she said that, even that thing, it, it's so duplicitous because at first she, she wants to ban fracking, but oh, then her campaign stuff. puts out a statement. You should go read it, Brian. It says, we're not opposed to all forms of fracking. So there's probably some somewhere where you use unicorns and pixie dust and they're, they're fine with that. But fracking itself, you know, they're not. But again, they, they didn't say we're fine with fracking. They said we're not opposed to all forms of fracking. And they didn't say what mm. forms they're not opposed well, to. People, so it means they're yeah. opposed to fracking. People in Pennsylvania should know it's on a pause right now all new leases they vote uh, right. and early voting should be in a couple of weeks kevin hassett thanks so much i'm steve Ducey. i'm brian Kilme. and i'm ainsley earhart and click here to subscribe to the fox Kamila soviet style joy republicans are nazis you cannot separate yourselves from the bad white people growing up I never thought much about race it never really seemed to matter that much at least not to me am i racist i would really appreciate it if you i'm left. trying to learn i'm on this journey i'm going to sort this out I need to go deeper undercover. They gonna say I'm racist. Joining us now is Matt, certified DEI expert. Here's my certification. And what you're doing is you're stretching out of your whiteness. This is more for you in this field. Is America inherently racist? The word inherent is challenging there. I'm gonna rename the George Washington Monument to the George Floyd Monument. America is racist to its bones. The, so inherently. Yeah, this country is a piece of white folks. White trash. White. This is the ad for the new Matt Walsh shit, right? All right, here. Zero questions as the de facto Democratic nominee. And that is an amazing accomplishment in and of itself, that she's been able to go almost an entire month without answering a single adversarial question this entire time. Because her campaign is two things, free money and joy. Those are the things, free money, joy, and zero questions whatsoever. She now says that she will commit to two presidential debates. Now, normally you have three presidential debates, but she is very huffy about having three presidential debates. The last thing she wants is that her positions be exposed before the American public as the communism light that they are, economically speaking, and the absolute sheer weakness and cowardice of her foreign policy. She doesn't want that exposed on stage, so she's going to minimize this as much as humanly possible. Yesterday, Team Harris said that they would have three debates total. They'd have one VP debate between Tim Walls and... J.D. Vance. Makes sense, because the last thing they want is J.D. Vance just tearing Tim Walls a new one over and over and over. As we will see, Tim Walls is a horrible vice presidential pick. What they really don't want is a repeat performance of Kamala Harris in front of the public. See, it took many debate performances in 2019, 2020 for her to come completely apart, for the wheels to come off the Kamala Harris bus. And so what they're hoping is that 
The less you see of Kamala Harris, the more you will like her, which frankly is a good strategy because the more you see of her, the more you dislike her. They put out a statement yesterday after Donald Trump had suggested that there'd be three presidential debates just like normal because the last candidate, you know, died. So he has said, why don't we have three presidential debates? She said, no, no, won't do it. Quote, the debate about debates is over. I like that they can just declare this. They can just randomly declare that the debate about the debates is over. That doesn't have any sort of totalitarian overtones. Donald Trump's campaign accepted our proposal for three debates. Totalitarian overtones. Kamala Stalin Harris only wanted to do one debate instead of three. Two presidential and a vice presidential debate. Assuming Donald Trump actually shows up on September 10th to debate Vice President Harris, Governor Walls will see J.D. Vance on October 1st, and the American people will have another opportunity to see the vice president and Donald Trump on the debate stage. It's so funny. Donald Trump was literally avoiding doing any debates at all harder than you avoid the top of the hour ad break. And now he's like, actually, no, it's Kamala Harris that's running away from the debate. There should be a thousand debates. Let a thousand debates bloom. You're doing a great job on the ass today. Thank you. Thank you, Kasha Leah. That's the kind of energy that I would like from more chatters. Okay. The kind of energy that allows you to no longer see the ads at the top of the hour. That is, here's the three minute ad break now. Rose Dog, thank you for the five tier one gift. In October. Now, what Democrats know is that they're going to ramp up the early voting as fast as humanly possible. And so by the time you hit October, half of their votes are already going to be in the can. Kamala Harris continues, voters deserve to see the candidates for the highest office in the land share their competing visions for the future. The more they play games, the more insecure and unserious Trump and Vance reveal themselves to be to the American people. Those games end now. I mean, the only campaign that's been playing games about the debates has been the Kamala Harris campaign. Because Donald Trump made a commitment to Joe Biden, who is no longer the actual nominee. Kamala Harris wasn't. I think the more. Okay. The more that the Trump campaign goes nutty mode, the more Ben has to, the more Ben Shapiro basically has to fucking readjust his commentary to reflect how stupid to reflect how stupid the Trump administration is. Like, I think Ben's smarter than this. Like, I I don't think Ben's a stupid guy by any fucking means, all right? I don't think so. But Ben knows what his audience is, what their demands are, and has to do commentary that is adjusted to, like, what the candidate is. It is pretty funny for him to just blatantly disregard reality in uh, in this situation. Because he's just like, yeah, it's actually the Kamala Harris that's like uh, against it. Uh, more debates. It's like everybody fucking heard Donald Trump run away originally from debating. Involved in those particular negotiations and then playing games to try and pretend that Trump is running away from them when in reality they are running as fast as humanly possible away from Donald Trump and J.D. Vance because they do not want to be in the public eye. And the reason they don't want to be in the public eye is because they've got nothing. They've got absolutely nothing. They just pasted a new face on the same old, terrible Joe Biden agenda, and they're hoping that nobody notices that. Now, they do have a problem, and that is that the ghost of Joe Biden is now haunting Kamala Harris. What the Harris campaign would prefer is for Joe Biden to go back into the crypt where he is kept every night and just to stay there. That is what they would prefer. They would prefer that no one associate Kamala Harris with Joe Biden, which would be quite a feat, considering that Kamala Harris would be an obscure, no-name California senator like Alex Padilla, if it were not for the fact that Joe Biden picked her up from the scrap heap of American politics and made her vice president on the basis of DEI qualifications. She is only famous because of Joe Biden. She's only a national figure because of Joe Biden. And by the way, from day one, he said this is the Biden-Harris White House. He said she was intimately involved in every decision. So she is tied at the hip to his policies, which is something that Joe Biden himself said. Peter Ducey asked him about it. And she's, and he said, she's not going to distance herself from my economic policies. By the way, he is right. The only economic policies she has are his. How much does it bother you like? that vice president... Okay, but like, but his economic policies aren't bad. Like, his advocacy for a lot of shit is actually some of the only good things that this Biden administration has done. I can't believe I'm saying this, but like... This is one of the good things that the Kamala Harris campaign is doing, which is following along, following along with like the good parts of Biden's uh, messaging and platform. What the fuck are we talking about? As I reiterated over and over again, good message, bad messenger was the situation. Okay. Good message, bad messenger was the issue with the Biden administration. 
Like, what are you going to do? The thing is, Ben can't fucking advocate against, like, you know, capping the price of insulin at $35 because his diabetic audience is going to fucking lose their minds if they find out that Ben is against that sort of thing because he's deeply vested, deeply invested in the, in the, um, in the profit margins of some of America's greatest mega corporations. That's just the problem. You can't talk about the expansion of the child tax credit being a negative thing because then you got people who want to have children who are greatly going to benefit from this. And if he actually openly states that, they're going to be like, wait, what the fuck are you saying? I want that, though. I want that money. Shut the fuck up, Ben. That's it. That's the issue. In a world where even the Republican Party is like increasingly drumming up populist economic messages... It is quite difficult for the likes of Ben Shapiro to openly advocate against policies like this. There are less and less people who take this like Redditor ass tone and go, no, neoliberalism is the way forward. Actually, when profits are good for corporations, like our lives are good too. Part of that is because the cost of living has greatly increased. So that has created a lot of resentment against mega corporations as well. Obviously, if you could still keep getting your cheap, cheap, affordable consumer goods at the same rate that you were able to get it, um, like in prior years, maybe there'd be less people chirping about monopolization. Maybe there'd be less people chirping about corporations, mega corporations in general. But that time is gone. You can't consistently advocate. You can't consistently advocate for like how a better future will only happen if the youth drop the notion that they're going to retire one day. You know what I mean? Like, that's a horrible way to fucking message. Parents might soon, for political reasons, start to distance herself from your economic... She's not going to. You don't think she's going to? He says she's not going to do it. He's very adamant. She's not going to do it. She's not going to do it. That's a problem for Kamala Harris because it turns out most people don't actually like her economic policies. In fact, recent polls showed 52% of Americans do not think America should move in the direction of California. And yet the same polls are showing that 52% of Americans are going to vote for Kamala Harris. What's the disconnect? She's hiding her policies. She's hiding herself. That's such a disingenuous way to interpret polls. What the fuck does that have to do? Bro, you said nothing about her economic proposals. This, this level of disingenuous framing is so silly, dude. Come on. Come on, brother. That is so, that's like, that's like a new low for Ben. I can't believe I'm saying this. Instead, she's smearing it over with a pastiche of joy. A pastiche of joy. We'll get to the, the joy component in just a moment. Biden, however, will not let this thing go. Kamala Harris is trying to hide everything about herself. It's all masquerading as joy. But I'll tell you where economic joy truly lies. Not spending that much on your cell phone company. There's only one. Fuck this guy. Said, yeah, Joe Biden was so concerned to let me know that he was connected with Kamala Harris, that he grabbed my arm. Yeah, he grabbed my arm in that answer. The president saying that the, the vice president Kamala Harris will not distance herself from the current economic policies. Now, the reality is that she's attempting to distance herself from Joe Biden while embracing even more communistic and socialistic policies. And she wants to have it both ways. She wants to both say that she was deeply embedded in Bidenomics, and also she has no responsibility for Bidenomics. So yesterday, she had to do a very awkward rally with Joe Biden, and it was indeed an awkward rally. And Joe Biden was out there touting Bidenomics, which, of course, is wildly unpopular. But he was saying things that she can't associate with because she actually requires the same voters that Biden had in the bag. So here was Joe Biden rallying with Kamala Harris yesterday saying everyone does better with more unions. I mean, if that were true, then there would be more than 7% of the workforce currently unionized in the private. Oh my God, I hate this monstrous piece of shit. Oh yeah, I saw this. Um, Aiden Ross will be moving to Germany if Kamala Harris gets elected for president. Every state votes Democrat. Private sector. It is eminently untrue. In fact, everyone does significantly worse with large scale unions. In the United States, consumers get absolutely screwed. Industries turn into zombie industries subsidized by the federal government. This is the story of the car industry in the 1960s and 70s in the United States. But here is Joe Biden trying to make sure that he's got those union voters in the bag for Kamala Harris. I love the idea. I love this. I love this. He's like, yeah, 
if unions are so good, why 7%? It's like, bro, why 7%? We're in America. Is it because of dipshits that pay your fucking salary have completely gutted labor unions? That's also part of the reason why there's no, like, mechanism of balance. It's completely out of whack. Corporations can do whatever the fuck they want, dude. There's more we can do for everyone. We can't give up. They told me every major piece of legislation we passed to give us the strongest economy in history and the strongest economy in the world. We got more to do for working people. And by the way, everybody does better when there's more unions. That is eminently untrue. As any business person will tell you, that is not true. Sometimes unions are good. The vast majority of the time, unions make demands that... Oh, any business person will tell you. What about the overwhelming majority of the population that are workers and not business owners? I like that he said, unions are bad. Source, Jeff Bezos. Unions are bad. Source, Bill Gates. He'll tell you how bad unions are. <laughs> Just understand that that's what he's saying, and that is the truth. Of course, they don't believe that. Unions are good. But try to understand... How, how at odds Ben Shapiro is with like the average working class person when he makes these kinds of arguments. You have no idea how many union employees listen to Ben Shapiro and agree with him? No, I do. I know. Americans, unfortunately, have been, of, uh, have been fed a steady diet of bullshit their entire fucking lives. They're primed to be reactionary. And the likes of Ben Shapiro can very easily take advantage of that messaging gap, take advantage of that fucking lack of education. Just show them shit like this. And maybe you'll be able to convince them that he's a demon. All of my coworkers have been repeating this video bar for bar since it dropped. Ben Shapiro still holds the youth. If you look at Ben, first of all, I know for a fact that he does not. Okay. I know for a fact that in the political sphere, this is 100% a factually accurate statement. In the YouTube political sphere, I have the youngest audience. Okay. Straight up, I have the largest 18 to 35 demographic in the entirety of the fucking uh, online political ecosystem. So anyone that tells you otherwise is lying to you. If you think that like Ben Shapiro is actually captivating youth with this kind of narrative, with this kind of fucking, with this kind of rhetoric, you're wrong. Actually bankrupt the businesses they're supposed to be negotiating with. Meanwhile, Kamala Harris was campaigning with Joe Biden and more of this, frankly. I think Republicans should be tying Kamala Harris to Joe Biden because again, she is only famous. She is only a problem. Yeah, I love this idiotic argument that unions actually bankrupt the businesses. So then what? Like unions are actually interested in like destroying the businesses. Who do you think the unions are comprised of, dumbass? It's the fucking workers. Obviously, they're not interested in bankrupting the fucking business that they are a part of. Because guess what? Then there's no fucking union. There's no wages. And there's no labor if there's no business. What an idiotic argument. It's so dumb. Prominent political figure. She's only a Democratic nominee because she was put in power by Joe Biden and she promptly turned around and stabbed him directly in the neck. Here she was at this rally bragging about her tie-breaking vote on the Inflation Reduction Act. So she doesn't want to own the inflationary record of the Biden administration, but she brags about being one of the people who was the deciding factor in the so-called Inflation Reduction Act which was one factor in the 40-year highs in inflation we have seen under this terrible what? administration. Yeah. No, he's right, dude. The Inflation Reduction Act, which came after record high inflation, was responsible for the record high inflation that preceded it. Thank you. No, he's right, dude. Uh, the, the Inflation Reduction Act actually was responsible for the inflation that happened before it, as is literally in the name, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it traveled throughout time and, and was able to fucking increase inflation before it could reduce it. Anyway, um, that argument is also fucking insanely stupid from, yes, the intellectual gladiator, according to Barry Weiss, when she used to work at the New York Times, by the way. Barry Weiss wrote an article at the New York Times about the intellectual dark web where she called Ben Shapiro an intellectual gladiator of the right. Thank you, Ben. Um... That was cool that he just dropped that in there. But also, these guys have complained non-fucking-stop about inflation and then also said Kamala has not taken ownership over the inflation. Now she's acknowledging that inflation is still a problem and wants to do something about it. 
And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What the fuck do you mean you want to do something about inflation? Hey, hey, that's communism. What are we talking about? You literally chirped about Kamala Harris acting like inflation wasn't real. Okay, she acknowledged it. And she said, this is my policy uh, prescription. This is my proposal. And now they're like, no, it's additionally stupid when he keeps saying uh, Kamala Harris has no policies, whereas like Donald Trump literally just keeps talking about inflation and he says we're going to cut prices in half and he has yet to answer for the how. Like he has not answered the how. How are you going to cut prices in half? It doesn't make any sense. Two years ago as vice president, I was proud to cast the time. Damn, this guy's good.